our final uh, topic, <laughs> a little bit more abstract. Um, uh, I have lots of friends who are interested in this, so it, it's, it might be worthwhile to touch upon. Um, you, you seem to be um, a little bit on the minority side in, in terms of the, the, the predictions that you have for the capabilities that digital computers will have. Um, and it relies on, uh, your ideas rely on, on, on a very particular uh, or a very, very particular theory of mind, so to speak, um, with a functionalist theory of mind or computational or a computational theory of mind, um, it, it, the, there doesn't seem to be a reason why a digital computer properly programmed wouldn't be able to experience life just as we do if you uh, add the proper inputs, you add the proper uh, isomorphisms of, of uh, information processing. <laughs> Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, on the other hand, uh, if I understand your metaphysical conception of the world, it would be something along the lines of idealistic um, monism, where there is one thing, and um, that's consciousness, that it happens to be um, shaped in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, you can correct, correct me if I'm terribly wrong. <laughs> um, so. I mean, the, so there are like these different conceptions of, of, of reality and, and the relationship um, of consciousness and, and the universe. What I'm really interested in is ways of testing these different possibilities. So how would we go about testing uh, whether a functionalist account of the mind is right or whether you are right in, in, in that respect? Um. Perhaps a, a more accurate uh, description of my position would be micro-functionalism as distinct from the, uh, the coarse-grained functionalism of, of, of critics. Um, before going any further, uh, perhaps it's worth stressing that uh, no one need buy into my uh, perhaps idiosyncratic uh, conception of the nature of mind and consciousness uh, to endorse the notion that we should phase out the biology of suffering. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, though I find uh, philosophical issues of mind and consciousness interesting, they aren't integral to the abolitionist project. So they're they're merely descriptive. Well, much more descriptive than prescriptive. <laughs> yes. Um, in terms of uh, yes. Uh, um, okay. Uh, here is uh, an example. Um, if I were to give you uh, the moves of a game of chess I have uh, played, uh, you could faithfully recreate the gameplay, but on the basis of the, the moves, you would know absolutely nothing whatsoever about the texture uh, of the pieces, or even whether they had any textures uh, at all. Perhaps I played the game online. Uh, now. You might say, well, the textures of the pieces, they don't really matter. We've captured the, the, the functional essence of the game. But the big difference between uh, humans and the game of chess is that if humans or other uh, sentient beings were mere zombies, i.e. if it wasn't even all dark inside but it didn't feel like anything at all, nothing would matter. So the textures of, of, of consciousness by analogy with the textures and the pieces of chess, uh, said the, the, the gameplay in the case of, 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 of humans and other sentient beings is, is rephrase that, sorry, the actual textures uh, are at least as important as the gameplay. Um, now that assumes that these textures are functionally, functionally incidental or irrelevant. Now, this remains to be shown. Uh, for what it's worth, I personally uh, think that it cannot be the case that some kind of epiphenomenalism is, is true, that the textures of consciousness are causally impotent. For a start, uh, epiphenomenalism is a perspective that, if it were true, would forbid its own arti articulation, that causally impotent epiphenomena couldn't cause us to uh, allude to uh, their own existence, let alone, let alone explore them. Um, and some of us at least spend a fair bit of our lives uh, exploring different varieties of consciousness, or in the case of more mainstream scientists, 
uh, exploring the neuro neural correlates of, of consciousness. It's by no means clear that uh, a classical digital computer could do this. What would uh, the software executed by such a program notionally imagine that human <laughs> psychonauts were doing, for instance? Um, what about what about this uh, following scheme to sort of uh, differentiate the two theories? Um, in order to sort of test the course of a functionalist, uh, connectionist model of the mind, uh, let's say I have a, a silicon chip uh, that is essentially a layer of synthetic neurons, or at least like functionally equivalent to neurons, not, not at the molecular level, just merely their uh, action potentials. Mm -hmm. um, and you replace one layer of neurons in a person's brain with this chip, that functions as an uh, intermediary between two parts of a brain, such that if it was the case that all the information processing that the brain was uh, doing was containing the uh, pattern of activation of the neurons, uh, such pattern would remain. Uh, it would go through the silicon layer, but nevertheless it would be the same information processing. Um, would, you, would you think that such experiment could be illuminating or... Um, would you be very skeptical of, of the results, or, and and of course, like you can ask the person, after you do the experiment, well, has your phenomenal experience changed at all whatsoever? It is true. I am personally skeptical uh, whether such a system would be capable of replicating object binding, phenomenal object binding, or a unitary self. And to highlight the computational advantage and the extraordinary computational power conferred by the capacity for uh, object binding or unitary self, it's merely necessary to look at particular neuro neurological symptom, symptom, syndromes where binding even partially breaks down, ranging from florid uh, schizophrenia uh, to simultaneousia where a subject can only see one object at once, to cerebral achinotopsia or motion blindness, where the subject cannot actually apprehend motion, but simply sees in individual frames. And so I would be very skeptical that this artificial brain could solve the binding problem. Recall uh, that though in one sense, uh, computers, uh, digital computers, classical digital computers, are uh, making extraordinary progress. We have to confront Moravec's uh, paradox. This, uh, uh, why is it that uh, a bumblebee, for instance, is far more sophisticated uh, in uh, open field, unstructured contexts, its behavior than anything that the Pentagon can come up with? Uh, and no one as yet really understands how the, the, the organic mind brain solves the binding problem, I mean, uh, uh, speculations, um, but yes, one cannot simply imagine that, it's, it, that it is straightforward simply to imagine organic, uh, replacing organic <laughs> neurons with silicon uh, neurons and they will be functionally isomorphic. Well, say, say they conduct experiment and the person doesn't have it, the, the person continues having um, phenomenal binding, there is absolutely no problem, maybe even some mild cognitive enhancements. Would that change uh, your views on the matter? Well, indeed, this would, this would falsify this, con uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, conjecture. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. Usually, metaphysical theories don't <laughs> are unfalsifiable. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's very fresh <laughs> to hear the possibility. Yes, uh, as I said, I, I would. Uh, what would seem to be uh, idle speculations on my part uh, do uh, yield uh, definite predictions. I would predict uh, that a classical digital computers will never be non-trivially uh, conscious. Uh, I would predict that if and when it is possible to uh, uh, inspect mind brains on sub picosecond time scales, it will be possible to uh, to actually capture the formal shadows of quantum coherent uh, uh, states. Uh, so yes, uh, what might appear to be idle philosophical musings could be uh, tested and operationalized.